mention that um, volume three of Dan and Brenda's Cathcart's Shadows of the Messiah is available again. We still have more of those left. And there was another book, too, that Pastor Mark mentioned. I don't know if there's any of those left up there. That was on Hebrew root words. Uh, there may be a couple left up there as well. So I'd like to welcome everybody again tonight, anyone who's a guest here. I'd like to welcome you, as well as our internet community, those that are around the world that listen to us. Uh, it's great to have you, and we don't take you for granted, that's for sure. Tonight, um, I'm going to continue with where I, uh, a little bit where I left off two weeks ago uh, in this Cornerstone series with the letters and the acts. And uh, Pastor Mark last week, of course, he covered the Torah community, and a lot of uh, what I'm going to cover is going to relate to what a Torah community is, but it's going to be in the light of the book of Acts. And uh, with the notes that you have, and I'm going to try to get through this, I may short-step myself, or um, I may go right to the last minute, I don't know. But if you have a question, I want you to raise your hand, and then I'll know you have a question. But I'm going to do my best to get through this, and if we have any questions, we might be able to answer them towards the end. Because by this time and through the Cornerstone series, I'm sure a lot of people have questions. And I think the importance of this part of what I'm going to be sharing tonight, what I shared uh, two weeks ago on the letters, uh, Paul's letters, and the, or, the, or not, only, just not only Paul's, uh, but Peter's, James, and John, uh, in light of the book of Acts, is important to know that, to understand those letters better. And so a little bit of what I'm going to cover in the first few minutes here is kind of a review. Uh, if you remember, uh, we started out where, where I began to drop off was in Acts 11.1. 1. And I talked about the itineraries of Paul, of which there were, there were basically three itineraries, and there could have been a fourth in there if you want to count uh, Paul's uh, journey to Rome when he was imprisoned. But in Acts 11.1 1 is where I want to pick it up. And it says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And how do we know how the Gentiles first received the word? Who, who did they hear it from? Okay, I better back up even more than a review. It was Peter that in the house of Cornelius who uh, first learned that. But in Genesis chapter 10, verse 1, I'm going to bring up this first PowerPoint. It says, Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and unto them were sons born after the flood. And in verse 5 it says, By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, everyone after his tongue, and their family, after their families, in their nations. Now, this, word, this is the first time the word Gentiles shows up in the Bible, and it's the, and the Hebrew word is goy, which means a foreign nation, it means a Gentile, uh, heathen, nation, people, okay? So, this is before Abraham ever showed up on the scene, but Abraham came out of the nations to become a father of nations. Now, the corresponding word in the Greek and in the Septuagint, which you see all through the book of Acts, and it's not always translated as Gentile. Sometimes it's translated as heathen, is the word ethnos. And it means a race, it means a tribe, a foreign, um, a foreign tribe, non-Jewish usually, a Gentile heathen nation. Okay, so when we see that word ethnos, that's what it's referring to, is referring to the Gentiles. And that's important when we get into the book of Acts. Now, after Peter goes in the, is in the house of Cornelius and they basically get saved, uh, in Acts 11:18, it says, when they heard these things, after Peter gave his account to those that were in Jerusalem, they held their peace and they glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And this word life becomes important later. It becomes a word uh, that, can, that has, can really affect a lot of people if it's said in the wrong way and there's stipulations put on it. So the result of the scattered believers was the diaspora, and so Jews actually scattered out as a result of the persecution that came from Stephen. And in Acts 11:19 it says, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but the Jews only. So on this map here, which, which you saw last week, 
all the way from Jerusalem here, the word sounded out to Cyprus. There were people from Cyrene, Antioch, uh, Cyprus, all in this area here. And I remember I went over with you the epistles and who they were addressed to and Peter's and so on. And so the word sounded out. But there were Jews that were already present, and I'm going to show that to you later. There were already Jews. So, so when the word came out, the word came out about Yeshua, it spread out into those regions. Verse 20, some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians. And the Grecians were not Greeks. They were Greek-speaking Jews who did not take the initiative or it was not available to learn the Hebrew language. And so they were known as Greek-speaking Jews, but they, they, they just never learned Hebrew. And, and Paul grew up in that arena, although he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and he was a Pharisee. He, he knew the Hebrew language, okay, besides Greek and, and possibly Latin, um, as well as maybe other languages. And so they were called Hellenists. Now, I, I mentioned this as well, that there were two Antiochs. One was, Syria, was the capital of Syria, which was about 16 miles from the sea, and it's on that map as well, which is up here. There's another Antioch. It's not on the map, but it's up in those regions up there. Well, the, the result was in Acts 11.22, the result of the word sounding out came in verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. Now, we know that Barnabas showed up in Acts chapter 4, and he was actually a Levite who sold land, and he was from Cyprus. So he was well known to the apostles that were in Jerusalem. Now, there were different centers of influences as the assemblies. You know, I can, I'm going to probably use the word church interchangeably here. Forgive me. It's the word ecclesia. It means assemblies. It means the called out. Okay? So I'm not talking about a building with a steeple on it. So there were different centers of influences. One of them was Jerusalem, where the word sounded out. Remember Yeshua in Acts 1.80 said the word's going to go to the uttermost parts of the earth, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And so uh, the centers of influence was, of course, Jerusalem. Antioch was another center of influence. And then up in this area, Antioch of Pisidia. And these were all areas where leadership was. And then, of course, it sounded out as they went further west. It's kind of a history and geography lesson at the same time. And so in Acts 11.25, Barnabas, when he departed, he went to Tarsus to seek for to seek Saul. If you remember, I covered all that history of when Saul met Yeshua on the road to Damascus and what his mission was and how many years were involved. It just wasn't an overnight thing. You know, he didn't go up to the altar and say, forgive me. Uh, and, and say the, the sinner's prayer, and then, you know, the next thing, it was an evangelist. It didn't happen that way. So it was a number of years, Saul went back to Tarsus, where he was from. And Barnabas went to, to, to look for him because he was on a mission himself to go to uh, Antioch, into those regions. And when he found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves together with the church, and they taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians, or if you remember, I talked about this word Christians, first in Antioch. Now, Acts 12, and I had mentioned this as well, can be dated precisely to 44 CE of the Common Era. And you can mark that in your Bibles because it's a historical fact. It kind of gives you, you can date backwards and you can date forwards, and that's how we can get the dating of the epistles and these itineraries and, and uh, the end of Paul's, basically the end of Paul's life, which is towards the book of Acts. Herod Agrippa I died in the seventh year of his reign, according to Josephus. He began to reign in 37 CE of the Common Era with the accession of Caligula. And you add those numbers together, you get 44 CE. Well, there was also a great famine that was prophesied by Agabus, who was a prophet. And, and in verse 27 of chapter 11, it says, There stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the, in the days of Claudius Caesar. Josephus says that the famine began in the year of Herod's death, which was in 44. So by now, the believers are somewhat unified, and from Antioch, which was a center of influence, they determined that the disciples in Acts 11.29, every man according to his ability was determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which was in the area of where Jerusalem was, which also they did. And so they sent this relief, which was probably in the form of money, 
uh, to the believers um, in that area, and they sent it by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Well, Acts 12 is a pinnacle point because this, if you remember, this is when Peter is imprisoned, and this is when James, who is uh, John's brother, was also killed. And this is when Peter was released from prison. Remember, the angel took him out and let him out into the street, and he didn't really, he thought he was dreaming. And he ends up at the house of, of uh, the house of Mary. And in Acts 12, 12, it says, when he considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John. Now, there's a reason I'm showing you this here. This house that they were in, the believers were gathered, and they were praying, basically, for Peter. And it was the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark. So it was John Mark. Where many were gathered together praying. Now in Colossians 4.10, Paul is addressing at the end of the epistle here a number of individuals. And he says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister's son or cousin to Barnabas. This is the Greek word sister's son. Is the word, it's actually for the word cousin. Touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. We don't know all of the background of that, but we'll we'll see that in a little bit in uh, the verses to come. But Mark, John Mark, was a a sister, son, or cousin to Barnabas. Now, what I want you to see here is these were people, these were blood relations that were moving the word. These are people just like you, uncles, cousins, handling some very touchy subjects and doctrines, and issues with family relations. Powerful things happening. And uh, just, like, just like you. you know, strong family ties, weak family ties, arguments, exaltations. And sooner or later, it'll affect things either positively or negatively. Well, Barnabas and Paul when they leave Jerusalem, they decide to take on a helper. And in Acts 12, 25, and I don't think this is on your notes, but in 12, 25, it says, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, which was to bring the relief to Judea, and they took with them John, whose surname was Mark. And this sets the stage for the beginning of the itineraries that Paul and Barnabas are going to begin to take. As the word begins to sound out, as Torah is beginning to be uh, sounded out to the nations. And so the, the first itinerary starts in Acts chapter 13 and actually goes to 16. In Acts 13, 1, it says that we're in the church that was at Antioch, and this is Antioch of Syria, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, So he's amongst that group as counted as apostle or a prophet. And Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they were going, they were becoming ambassadors. They were being sent out to the regions, okay, we're tight. This is the headquarters up in the north here. We're tight. The Lord said, you guys need to go and carry Torah out. Okay? And, uh, and so being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, they departed unto Seleucia and then sailed to Cyprus. And if I can bring up that next PowerPoint. So here, where you can see, this is where Jerusalem is down here, Antioch is in this area, Seleucia here is almost like a port, and they take a ship and they go over to Cyprus. Who was from Cyprus? Barnabas was from Cyprus, okay? Now, if Barnabas was from Cyprus, who was on that island? His family was, the people that he probably grew up with, okay? And they land at Salamis here, and you can see they, they end up over on the other side of the island, but they had John Mark with them. And there's a number of things that happen uh, when they're there. Now, Seleucia, as I mentioned, is a port. And that's what it probably, that's the area. In fact, they say that this was, it, this, uh, was potentially part of the dugout port uh, of ancient Seleucia where uh, ships would take off to go out west to, uh, into the Mediterranean. 
Now there was incidents that occurred on that island. We don't have time to go over all of these in detail, but I'm just gonna brush over some things. This is where uh, they were confronted with someone whose name was Elimaeus of the Sorcerer, who tried to turn the deputy in pathos uh, to, uh, away from the word. And this was, uh, this was the one place where, uh, the first place that Paul ever called someone a child of the devil, of which he called Elimaeus the Sorcerer. And when he looked on him, he went blind. So this is one of the first incidents of this first itinerary. As we start, hey, Barnabas, it's going to be a pretty good trip. <laughs> first guy they encounter and they witness to, the guy goes blind. So in Acts 13 now, this is really significant. They do what they do, and how long they were there, we don't really know. But they loose from, that, that from, uh, from Cyprus, from Pathos, and it says they came to Perga and Pamphylia. Now, Pamphylia is here, and this is where Pathos was, and it says John Mark, somewhere between here and here, or whether it happened here or whether here, John Mark split. And it never really says why he split, but, he, but you've got to remember, he was, maybe he wanted to stay on the island because he had relatives there, or whatever it was, but he didn't go with Paul and Barnabas, and so Paul and Barnabas went on their own. And it says in verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and then they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and they sat down. So they went, they went right up, and I don't show it, well, here it is right here, when they sailed to here, and you can see that this is a mountainous region that's, that's here. Here's Pisidia, the area of Pisidia, the area of Galatia. There's no town by the name of Galatia. Okay, the Galatians were in a region, so they're all called Galatians. But this is Antioch of Pisidia, and the, the terrain was, you know, they had to do some traveling by foot. And it took a while to get there. But when they got there, there was a synagogue there. And it says, on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue. And they sat down. And in Acts 13, 15, it says, after the reading of the law and the prophets. Now tell me, what is the law and the prophets? In our language. Old Te well, that's a good one, Old Testament. The, simply the law and the prophets is Torah and the half Torah. Okay, remember Jesus went into the synagogue and, and the scroll was delivered and they opened the place to where it was written. You have the law, law, the reading of the law, which like Pastor Mark teaches, Torah, and then there was the half Torah, it was the prophets. Okay, that was what the reading, that's what they did 2,000 years ago for a very, very long time. And the rulers of the synagogue, after the reading, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, You men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Whether he was reporting to, to Paul and, and, and Barnabas or not, I don't know. But it was a word of it. If anybody has anything to say, say on. So Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, he said, Men of Israel, and you that fear God, give audience or listen up. And Paul goes through a dissertation where he takes them all the way from the Jews in Egypt through the 40 years in the wilderness, the judges, Samuel, Saul, David, John the Baptist, all the way through Yeshua and the resurrection. And then it says after, after Paul preaches, after, and then after the reading of the Torah portion in Acts 13.42, it says when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Who is it that, uh, that wanted the words preached to them the next Sabbath? The Gentiles. Okay? This may have been for some of them the first time that they'd heard about Yeshua. And in verse 43, it says, Now when the congregation was broken up, it means when it dissembled. It doesn't mean that it broke up. It says, Many of the Jews and pro religious proselytes. Who are religious proselytes? They're Gentiles who converted to Judaism. That's who the proselytes. So you have Gentiles who wanted to, hey, we want to hear about this next week. Then you have the proselytes who were converted Jews who, who, who were also there, and then there were Jews. They followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And so in verse 44, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city together came to hear the word of God. That's quite an accomplishment. Anybody want to do that with me tomorrow? See if we can do that, if we could go to uh, Lakewood or if we can go to um, Olympia or something and by the next week have the whole city turn out. That'd be quite a feat, wouldn't it? But they did it. Well, from there, they went on to Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. If 
I can get that next slide. And so now take a look at this terrain all the way from here, and then they head all the way over to where Iconium is, and it's a distance. I'll just tell you this right now. Between Lystra and Derby, it's 60, over 60 miles. So you can imagine the distance between Antioch and Iconium. So they were on the road for a while. It's a good thing the price of gas was low. <laughs> And in Iconium, a large number of Jews and Gentiles believed. And it says they stayed there a long time. But in their preaching there, in the time that they spent there, the city was actually divided. There were Jews that uprose, and there was a division between the Jews and the Gentiles, and they had to flee to Lystra and Derbe in this area here. And that was the area where it was the miracle of the healing on the crippled man who had never walked. That was in Lystra. And it was also the area where they tried to worship Paul as Mer Mercurius. You remember that? And Barnabas as Jupiter. They called them gods. And then the unbelieving Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and they stoned Paul. So these guys were so committed, they said, we need to follow these guys. They're causing issues. And so they catch up with Paul and, and Barnabas and Lystra and Derby, and they end up stoning Paul, who they thought was dead. And it says the believers gathered around him, and whatever happened, he got up. And he went back to the city in verse 21, and he preached again. And then, so what happened? Now follow this here. This is really important. Think about the period of time. What did you do a month ago? In verse 20 says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. So they, went, they just went backwards. They finished here. Paul got up after he was thrown out of the city and went back in, preached some more. Then they went through Lystra, Iconium, the same way. See, so here's Antioch down here. But they had a mountain range over here, so they just went around the horn, back to Antioch, and then down. What did they do? Verse 22, it says, they confirmed the souls of the disciples and exhorted them to continue in the faith. So they were going back over the believers that they'd witnessed to and that they'd met and that they'd got together. Where were they gathering? In the synagogue. So they were, they were able to meet up with those folks there, and they confirmed the, that they were the souls of the disciples. They exhorted them to continue in the faith, and that we must, uh, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. In verse 23, it says, when they ordained them elders in every church or in every assembly... And had prayed with fasting, they commended him to the Lord on whom they believed. So they had, a, they had a definite plan here by the Holy Spirit. I mean, they went through, they went back, they confirmed the disciples who were, who were around, who still wanted to hear them. They prayed with them, and then they ordained elders. They say, okay, now I want you to watch over these guys. Keep them going. You know, keep them blessed. Teach them. And then after they had passed through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they reached, preached the word in Perga... Perga is down in this area down here, so they came all the way down, and then they sailed again, and they went back to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended, or they would be commissioned, to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. And when they were come, they gathered everybody together. They said, we're back. How long were they gone? They were gone for a while, okay? How long? I, I don't know. But... They were gone for a while, and they came back, and they gathered everybody together, and they said, but guys, you've got to hear this, the stuff that, we, that happened with us. They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And then it says in verse 28, there they abode a long time with the disciples. So they were in Antioch for a while before anything really started happening. So they came back with all these great testimonies, people that they knew, connections that they made. There were, you know, there were things going on. The word was moving out. And then they stayed in Antioch for a while. Well, the assemblies of Galatia, when we read the book of Galatians, the assemblies of Galatia were that of Pisidia, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. So those are the areas that we're, we're, we're talking about. Now, things started to brew up because the word gets around town and what's happening especially when you're making something happen. And they were making something happen. Okay, but there were things happening too in, in Israel and in Jerusalem. This is not happening in Israel. This is happening outside the land. And in verse 1, and this is where it opens the door for the, the council at Jerusalem. It says certain men, 
came down from Judea. Now, when it says come down, okay, <laughs> you know, Judea is south, so if you're going up to Antioch, how do you come down? Well, what they're talking about geographically it was a mountainous region, so when you, they were talking about coming down geographically, not, this, not north, south, east, or west. That's what it means. So they came from Jerusalem or Judea up to Antioch, but it was actually going down, okay, because Mount Moriah, Jerusalem's on a, on a higher level. And this is what they taught the brethren. And they said, except you are circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now, this word manner in the, word, in the Greek is the word ethos. And it means according to the custom or to the traditions. So it didn't say Torah. It just said according to the customs of Moses. You cannot be saved. And it says, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, which is a figure of speech that means they really got fussed about it, right? And disputation with them. And that word disputation, in the Greek it means mutual questioning or discussion or reasoning. What does that sound like when you put that into Hebrew terms? They were midrashing. Oh, what do you mean by that? What are you guys, what are you guys doing? We just came back from this great trip, all of these Gentiles were saved, we had all of these great miracles. What are you guys doing? Antioch was doing great, and then you guys come up here, and you're telling them they need to be circumcised to, to be saved. What are you doing? These individuals were known as, the, this were pre-Ebonites, or they were known as Ebonites or pre-Ebonites, Ebionites. The Ebionite Christians believed that Je Jesus was the Jewish Messiah sent from the Jewish God to the Jewish people in fulfillment of Jewish scriptures. They also believed that to belong to the people of God, one needed to be Jewish. As a result, they insisted on observing the Sabbath, keeping kosher, and circumcising all males. But the Ebionites, Ebionites Jewishness did not endear them to most other Christians who believed that Jesus allowed them to bypass the requirements of the law for salvation. So they had ideas of their own about what salvation was. Another aspect of, of the Ebionites is that that set them apart was their understanding of who Yeshua was. They didn't subscribe to the notion of uh, Yeshua's divinity. So even though the word was moving out in Judea and in Samaria, there were a lot of different groups, just like there are today, that had different ideas about who Jesus was. And they came up to Antioch and they wanted to give their two cents about what they believed on how to be saved, or it's the word so so in the Greek, which means made whole. And so the whole question that they brought, that they were midrashing around, it was, it was about Gentile salvation. Well, who were a lot of the people that were in the Galatian region? There was a lot of Jews, but there was also a lot of Gentiles. And the pharisaical opinion was that they must be circumcised to be saved. And so they decide that they all need to get together, and they need to go down to Jerusalem. And in Acts 15.1, it says certain men came down, and there was no small dissension. Well, anyway, what happened was is they ended up going down to Jerusalem. And in 15.5, it says there arose up a certain sect of the Pharisees which believed, saying. Now, in the Revised Standard Version reads a little bit differently, but it gives a little different view. It says some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. So there were believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and saying it's necessary to circumcise them and charge them to keep the law of Moses. So this group, they believed more from the teachings of the Pharisees as opposed to the teaching of the Torah. The other interesting thing is here is charging them to keep the law of Moses. Now this word keep, which is pretty, it's a significant word all through the Brit Hadashah, is the Greek word tereo, and it means to guard. And is actually referring to putting up fences around Torah. 
And this is something that Paul or any of the, the Jewish people would have known. It comes from the Talmud. It comes from uh, Perkaya Vot 1.1, the ethics of the fathers, which many, of course, Pharisees had to memorize all, a lot of the Talmud. And so they knew what it meant to guard or to keep the law of Moses, to guard the law of Moses, which was to put up a fence. Now, the members of the great assembly said that there were three things or three fundamental principles that the Mishnah taught that was the bottom line for passing or teaching Torah. The first one was to be deliberate in judgment. In other words, what makes you a human being? You know, your ability to choose between your drives, what you feel like doing, and what you know you should do. So you have the Yetzer Har, the Yetzer Tov, the good inclination, and the evil inclination, the two natures that are in every individual. And so they said you need to be deliberate in judgment. Are you going to decide to, do, to be this, or are you going to decide to do that, if you're going to keep Torah? The second point was to stand up many students. The goal of Torah was to communicate the fundamental understanding of who the Jewish people were, you had an obligation to learn and to spread it around. Teach it to them and stand them up to teach others, which is something that Pastor Mark shared last night about the Torah community, able men who can teach others also. And then the third point was to make a fence for the Torah. To ensure the success of any endeavor or system, it's necessary to insulate against failure. Now listen to this. You want to minimize the likelihood of failure and minimize the damage failure causes. The 613 mitzvot, or the commandments of the Torah, are physical manifestations of spiritual principles. Mitzvot addresses situations where we have a physical drive or a hunger to act one way and a moral ethical commandment to act in another way. They create a conflict between a desire and a will and they give us an opportunity to choose. And each time we decide, we either lift or we lower ourselves. The choice is ours. The sages understood this struggle and they created fences to assist us in fulfilling our potential. Fences are rabbinic laws, customs and decrees that expand the definition of Torah laws. One role of a fence is to limit the likelihood of failures. Listen to that terminology. Limit the likelihood of failures that would damage your soul by creating a boundary before the point of actual damage, the sages ensure that even an error bringing you across that line will still leave you short of the point of true damage. It's like, I don't know if I can ever do anything right. Another critical role of rabbinic fences is to maximize our opportunities to choose. If we recognize that each mitzvah, which is a good work, is a tool to perfect some aspect of the soul, then it is almost disappointing that there is some mitzvah that we seldom have a chance to experience. The sages have given us additional chances to choose. Well, what were those additional chances to choose? They were the fences, they were traditions or customs to add to what Torah said, just in case you got too close to the line, okay? So we drive every day on the highway, and we have dividers, we have fences, so that if you just go a little bit too close to the edge, the fence will catch your car. It will wreck it a little bit, okay? Well, that's what the sages did. They created a fence around Torah, and if it, if, if it dealt with something about being unclean, they felt, well, for you not to, be, to go into an area being unclean, you ought to do these other things. And all those other little things built up to where it became legalistic, to where they began to look at each other and to judge each other and say, wait a minute, don't touch that. Or were you doing that? And it becomes legalism, and that's what fence is created, and that's what Yeshua came to say, hey, which, is, which one do you want to do? Because you teach for doctrines the commandments of men. Remember he said that? Now, all of you Hebrew students, if I bring up that next PowerPoint, who can tell me without the vowels what this word is? Okay, we have the hey. Halakha, very good, Mitzi Young. <laughs> Halakha is the path that one walks, 
Okay, that's what the, the Jewish people believe, requiring a person to be circumcised before he has a relationship with Yahweh. This particular tradition overturns the Torah. The word halakha is usually translated as Jewish law, though a more literal and appropriate translation would be the path that one walks. Some non-Jews and non-observant Jews criticize this legalistic aspect of traditional Judaism, saying that it reduces religion to a set of rituals devoid of spirituality. But, now this is from a Judaistic point of view, when properly observed, halakha increases the spirituality in a person's life. I'm not quoting this. This is quoted from a Jewish point of view. So this, the more halakha you do, right, the more you're going to increase your spirituality. Because it turns the most trivial mundane acts, such as eating and getting dressed, into acts of religious significance. True, maybe, when people write and ask how to increase their spirituality or influence, what we can say is observe more halakha. When you do these things, you're constantly reminded of your relationship with the divine. So they believe that the more halakha you do, right, the more mitzvah you do, you become closer to God. So it's in, an, it's in the category of these works, okay? And so when these men came down from Judea to Antioch and they said these, these guys need to be circumcised if they're going to be saved, they were saying that they had to be circumcised before they had a relationship with Yahweh. And that tradition alone was what overturned the Torah, But even more so of what they were saying is this amounted to Gentiles having to convert because that's what circumcision was, was you had to convert to Judaism first in order to be saved. So it was really a backward situation. You know, here, here they are Gentiles, they have, to become a, they have to become Jewish in order to believe in Yeshua. And it was a pretty confusing situation. Well, in this Jerusalem council where Paul and Barnabas are now present, with the elders of the church that are in Jerusalem, in Acts 15, verse 6, it says, The apostles and the elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing or midrashing about it, Peter rose up and he said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God made choice among us, which was him, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Now follow these words here, because Peter is very strategic on what he says. God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Now, this word purifying their hearts by faith is an interesting phrase because in Romans 2.29, what is it talking about? It's talking about the circumcision of the heart. It's talking about the renewed covenant, the Brit Hadashah. He is a Jew in Romans 2.29, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the what? The heart. In the spirit and not in the what? The letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. And the reason Paul puts that phrase in there is because the Judaizers, when they, when they were, were proselytizing, they kept count of who they circumcised. So it was a big... Everybody, I got everybody's attention. I wonder why. But they would keep track of it. They would keep track that that would be their proselytes. Well, we had five do the Brit this, this week. You know, here's the foreskins I can show you. And... The, but they kept, so it was boasting in that. See? And so the praise is not of men, but of God. Well, what about the yoke? The yoke is the oral law. It's the traditions of the fathers that are halakhic legal requirements. So there were the fences that were put around Torah. And you remember Yeshua said, he says, take my yoke, because my yoke is what? It's easy, and it's light. And, and in 1 John it says, my commandments you know, do the commandments if you love me because my commandments are not what? Grievous. They're not hard. What is hard? The fences. Because you've got to leap over them to get to the commandments. Well, let's back up a minute. What was it exactly that Peter did teach to Cornelius' household? In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, it says how God anointed 
Yeshua of Nazareth, with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained to God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. And to him give all the prophets, referring to the Torah, the Tanakh, witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall re- receive remission of sin, sins. So when it says through his name, it says whosoever. Who is included in that whosoever? Whosoever, the Gentiles, okay? They're included as well. Well, why would the Gentiles be excited about remission of sins? Why would they be excited about that? And what gives a big key to this now is to take a look at Paul's, uh, what his viewpoint was or what happened in the epistle of Galatians during this period of time, which happened in Jerusalem and Antioch. In Galatians chapter 2, now these verses are from the Moffat's version of the Bible. It's just another version of the Bible. And it, the dialogue, it makes it a little plainer to see where Paul was coming here from. And you remember in Galatians chapter 1, he says, but I certify, brethren, that the gospel that I preach is not after man. He received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay, so he set his credentials. He set his credential many times that he met Yeshua on the road to Damascus. Then 14 years later, I went up to Jerusalem again. This is 14 years after his meeting Yeshua on the road to Damascus. So in these 14 years, you have, that includes that first itinerary, the time he spent in Antioch, the time he spent in Arabia, and so on. I was accompanied by Barnabas. I took Titus with me also. It was in consequence of a revelation that I went up at all. So he's saying, the reason I went along with these guys is because the Lord told me to. I didn't go on my own because these guys said, hey, you should probably go and talk to, P- to Peter and James and John about this. He went up by revelation. Okay, so that, that needs to get into your heart that, that the Lord told him to do that. And he says, I submitted the gospel and I'm in the habit of preaching to the Gentiles, submitting it privately to the authorities to make sure that my course of action would be and had been sound. So he followed, he did everything the right way, okay? And he went to who was the authorities, who would have been the elders, and he told them, hey, this is what we've been doing, guys. Because these other guys came up to Antioch, and, you know, we just had this great missionary journey, and these guys come up, they start undoing everything we did. But even my companion Titus, Greek though he was, was not obliged to be circumcised. There were traitors of false brothers, who had crept in to spy out the freedom we enjoy in Christ Jesus. They did aim at enslaving us again, but we refused to yield for a single instant to their claims. We were determined that the truth of the gospel should hold good for you. Besides, the so-called authorities, and it makes no difference to me what their status used to be, God pays no regard to the externals of men. These authorities had no additions to make to my gospel. It shows Paul's confidence and what he had learned. Now, who was he hanging out with? Who, who were his companions? Who had Barnabas been with? Barnabas was related to those folks back in Jerusalem. Remember John Mark, the house of Mary? You know, Peter was friends with them. There, there was, it was all family. So the, it wasn't like Paul, he, he not only got revelation from Yeshua, but a lot of the stuff was confirmed with, with Peter and those other guys as well. And then Paul took off into the other regions. But he said it doesn't make any difference. You know, these guys sent up, you, you sent up these uh, emissaries who decided to, to undo everything that we did. He says, God is no respecter of persons. But on the contrary, when they saw I'd been entrusted with the gospel for the benefit of the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been for the circumcised. For he who equipped Peter to be an apostle of the circumcised equipped me as well for the uncircumcised. And when they recognized the grace I had been given, the so-called pillars of the church, James, Cephas, or Peter and John, gave myself and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Our sphere was to the Gentiles, theirs was to the circumcised. And now comes these actions by Peter. In verse 11 it says, When Cephas or Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. 
The man stood self-condemned. Before certain emissaries of James arrived, he ate along with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and hold aloof because he was afraid of the circumcision party. So Peter was up in Antioch. He was eating with the Gentiles. They were having oneg after on Shabbat, having a great time. And then these emissaries show up from Judea, and he withdraws from the Gentiles and, hey, I can't come to oneg tonight. Or they're in the same place eating, and he moves nicely from one table over to the next. And Paul says, you know, what's going on? You see, table fellowship is a rite of hospitality for a joint heir with Christ. And so in verse 13, it says, the rest of the Jewish Christians also played false along with them, so that even Barnabas, it says even Barnabas was carried away by their false play. That false play uh, is also translated dissimulation, which is the word hupokritos, acting under a feigned part. It's like an actor that has two masks in a play. Now on this, now on that. And Paul confronted him. But when I saw that they were swerving from the true line of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of them all, if you live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, though you are a Jew yourself, why do you oblige the Gentiles to become Jews? We may be Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Gentiles were concerned as pagans. Their concern was, how do we become children of God? Paul later explained that you become a child of God through Abraham. This is about the law and the promise, which came through Abraham. The Jews already had that promise back in Genesis. They already had that promise. By faith, the Gentiles took the promise of faith by Abraham, but some Jews didn't accept the promise. Moses did, Abraham did, David did, Isaiah did, but there were some that didn't accept that promise. The law is what, the Torah is what showed them how to live and how to be sanctified. And so in verse 16, it says of Galatians 2, it says, knowing that a man is not justified or made righteous by the works of the law, but by the faith of Yeshua HaMashiach. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay, I'll follow this as we get into the fast lane. When we talk about works to the Jews, that that means mitzvot. Circumcision is a mitzvot. The Dead Sea Scrolls comprise, among other things, are the oldest copies of the Bible in existence. The Qumran Scrolls date from approximately 250 B.C. to about 65 A.D., and others at other locations of 135 A.D. Now, the phrase Ma'asah Torah means work, works of the Torah, or works of the law, appeared first in the Dead Sea Scrolls, indicative of the ultra-religious Halakha of the Essenes, and also the Halakha of the Pharisees. This is not referencing the Torah of Yeshua, it's not the Torah that's written upon the heart. And this is from a notation in uh, the Aramaic New Testament. The term, uh, bring up this next PowerPoint. Okay, the term works of the law has shown up as a technical, technical theological term used in a document in the Dead sea, Dead sea Scrolls called MMT, which says, and this is the quote from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and these are the lines. Now, we have written to you some of the works of the law, those which we determined would be beneficial for you, and it will be reckoned to you as righteousness, in that you have done what is right and good before him. So this is in the Dead Sea Scrolls long before Paul ever showed up. It's saying that if you do the works of righteousness, that, or these works of the law, it'll be reckoned to you as righteousness. This comes, and these are the lines, 4QMMT, out of the section 4Q394 to 399, section C lines 26B to 31. You can look it up for yourself. It's on the Internet. What are some of the works of the law way before Paul who would have been familiar with this term, works of the law? Concerning the offering of Gentile grain, which they are, and allowing or to touch it or to defile it, no one should eat from Gentile grain or bring it near the sanctuary. Concerning the hides of cattle and sheep and fashioning their hides from vessel, no one's allowed to bring them near the sanctuary. Concerning hides and bones of unclean animals, nobody can make handles for vessels. Concerning dogs, no one can bring dogs near the holy camp because they might eat some of the bones from the sanctuary while the meat's still on them. Those are fences. Those are works of the law. 
That's the phrase that Paul was familiar with of what he was quoting in Galatians, the works of the law that they thought if you did them, you would become righteous. Yeshua was the one that was suppressing those particular works of righteousness. The difference between Torah law and rabbinic law is that Jewish law includes laws that come directly from the Torah. And, law, and then there are laws that are enacted by rabbis. Even laws enacted by the rabbis would be considered derived from the Torah. The Torah gives certain people the authority to teach and make judgments about the law. So these rabbinic laws should not be casually dismissed as laws of man or as, or as opposed to the laws of God. In Deuteronomy 17.9, and it's kind of taken out of context as what they use from this verse, it's talking about certain situations where the priests or the Levites had to make judgment upon certain situations and they could bring a sentence of judgment. So what they were saying was is that whoever was in the position of being a Levite or a judge, just like the Supreme Court today can enact law, they could say, well, you know, uh, they're too close to the sanctuary, you can't have dogs. And if you do, you're unclean and blah, 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 and you're not gonna be righteous, and those were all fences. This is what Paul was talking about. So justification and salvation didn't come by circumcision. This is huge. That it, they found this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that that's what the works of righteousness were referring to. So when Paul talks about not being under the law, that's what he's talking about, those fences. And so there were four points that they agreed on at that council, and that was not eating things that were sacrificed to idols, which was from Exodus 34:15 in the Torah, or from, or from consuming blood in Leviticus 17:10, or things that were strangled in Leviticus 17:15, or a fornication. So at the end of this itinerary, and after this, they, the apostles bless Paul and Barnabas, and they send them out, and they say, bring these four points to the Gentiles. We want them to be at peace. We don't want the yoke of bondage to be on them. And so in Acts 15.35, it says, Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And they also took with them some other men. Silas was one of them. And in verse 36, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, now they were, it says after some days, which means that they were in Antioch. They were there for a while. And after some days, Paul said, hey, let's go again and visit our brethren in every city where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them, from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from another. And so Barnabas took Mark, and he sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas, who was sent by the apostles to Antioch, and departed being recommended by the brethren to the grace of God. And so they went throughout Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. And this was, uh, would lead into a second missionary or itinerary, which we're certainly not going to cover tonight. But remember who Peter wrote to. Bring up that last PowerPoint. In 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, this, and Peter's epistle was written long after, towards the end of the first century, closer to after Paul died, when he, uh, before he was killed. And these areas here, you can see Bithynia, Pontus is all the way up here, Cappadocia. So Peter had relationships with all of those people up in that area, because he was up in that area as well. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost... After they, after they received Holy Spirit, and it says they were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, and it names them Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And so the, those, many of those present on the day of Pentecost we're now in these regions moving the word with Paul and Peter and the, other, and the other apostles and prophets. And so in 1 Peter 5, verse 2, Peter says, and this is long after Paul had already been in the region, feed the flock of God which is among you, 
taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And that word constraint, in the Greek, it means compelling, where you're compelling people to do things. Well, what were the Jews doing back in those regions when they said that somebody had to be circumcised to be saved? They were compelling them. Legalism is what, is what you have to compel people is where legalism shows up. And he says, neither is being lords over God's heritage, but by being examples to the flock. And that word lords in the Greek, it means controlling. And in verse 4, it says, when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And that is Yeshua, our cornerstone, who came to set us free. Why don't we all stand? I hope you learned a little bit tonight about the first itinerary. <laughs> Father, thank you for this evening and bless these people, Lord, that they, there's something that they can grasp a little more from your Torah, from your word, to tie together the Brit Hadashah with your, your Tanakh and Torah uh, that they might help someone else. We thank you for that. We love you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Thank you for studying with us today. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's Pastor Mark at El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom.